since nobody wanted to say anything, I'll take a few minutes of your time. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, first uh, first of all, I'd like to make some comments in connection with a rather st startling statement which was made by uh, Ambassador Yuri Sergeyev of Ukraine at this stakeout on uh, March 4. Uh, responding to a question, he said, and I quote, Russia, at that time Soviet Union, tried to press Western allies to recognize uh, what you called Banderas and others, that they were killers. Why Nuremberg process didn't recognize that? Because it was falsified. Because the position of the Soviet Union was not fair at that time, end of quote. <clears throat> What I'd like to say is the following. Massive documentary evidence proves that the organization of Ukrainian nationalists, OUM, and Ukrainian insurgent army, UPA, collaborated with the Nazis. They took part in mass killings of civilians and punitive operations against partisans in Belarus, Ukraine, and Poland. On June 30, 1941, with the invasion of Ukraine by Nazi troops, Stepan Bandera issued the Act of Proclamation of Ukrainian Statehood, which declared that, and I quote, the newly formed Ukrainian state will work closely with the National Socialist Greater Germany, which under leadership of Adolf Hitler is forming a new order in Europe and the world, end of quote. In 1941, Ukrainian Nazi collaborators provided the majority of the execu executioners who murdered over 150,000 Jews in Babi Yar in Kiev. Gypsies and Soviet prisoners of war were also executed there. In 1942, Aoun was involved in a campaign of ethnic cleansing in Volynia, Poland. Over 100,000 women, children, and unarmed men were slaughtered. Polish historians calculated that 135 different sadistic methods were used to kill innocent people. In 1942, Aoun's campaign of mass extermination of Poles and Jews continued. On January 28, 2010, Simon Wiesenthal Center expressed, and I quote, deepest revulsion, unquote, at the decision by then President of Ukraine to honor Aoun's leader Bandera, and I quote, who collaborated with the Nazis in the early stages of World War II and whose followers were linked to the murders of thousands of Jews and others, end of quote. On February 25, 2010, the European Parliament adopted a resolution in which it expressed deep regret for the decision posthumously to award Bandera, a leader of the OUN, which collaborated with Nazi Germany, the title of National Hero of Ukraine. The European Parliament called on the Ukrainian leadership to reconsider such decision and maintain its commitment to European values. Polish President Lech Kaczynski stated on February 7, 2010, that Aoun and UPA, and I quote, were engaged in mass murders of Polish civilians in the eastern territories of the Second Republic, killing 100,000 people. Poles were being killed for being Poles, end of quote. It is deeply disturbing that the followers of Bandera are openly marching these days in Ukraine, displaying his portraits and fascist insignia, and are wielding considerable political power in Kiev. Attempts to whitewash Aoun Umpa are not only morally repulsive, they amount to encouraging nationalist ideology, extremism, and intolerance. Now I'll move back to our discussion today. As you know, we heard <coughs> a briefing from Mr. Eliasson. I'm sorry, uh, Ambassador Lyle Grant, who requested the consultations, was not here, so I came to the stakeout first. I'll be very brief. Uh, uh, we appreciated the, uh, the remarks which Mr. Eliasson made, where he described his understanding of the situation. Uh, we welcome the fact that Mr. Shimonovich uh, is there in Ukraine now and uh, hopefully will be able to meet with people and uh, who will give them their understanding of the uh, situation with human rights in, uh, in that country. Uh, I also sort of continued the discussion we had at the previous meeting of the Security Council when uh, some colleagues were talking about diplomacy, uh, democracy in Ukraine and, uh, and uh, uh, we're referring to the new uh, authorities as legitimate authorities. So I went back uh, to this uh, transcript of the phone conversation between the Foreign Minister of Estonia and uh, uh, Baroness uh, Ashton of March uh, 
Uh, five, I, I explained that I did it for two reasons. Uh, one, uh, the Foreign Minister of Estonia confirmed that those were authentic uh, uh, remarks which he made. And two, unfortunately, uh, that transcript, which created quite a stir in uh, Russian and some European media, was completely ignored by the mainstream uh, American uh, media. And I specifically uh, quoted two uh, elements of uh, the remarks uh, which uh, the Foreign Minister of Estonia made to, uh, to his uh, 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 to, to, to uh, Baroness Ashton, the first one when he describes the intimidation of the members of parliament of Ukraine, when unwanted people visit them uh, and when uh, uh, the journalists who accompanied him saw uh, a member of parliament being beaten up in broad daylight in downtown Kiev. So you can imagine what is happening outside of broad daylight on the uh, eyes of journalists. So under those circumstances, it's hard to imagine how such a parliament uh, operating under such circumstances can be regarded as a legitimate parliament which can pass legitimate decisions on the future of Ukraine. And, and the second quotation which I uh, presented to members of this happening outside of broad daylight and the uh, eyes of journalists. So under those circumstances, it's hard to imagine how such a parliament uh, operating under such circumstances can be regarded as a legitimate parliament which can pass legitimate decisions on the future of Ukraine. And, and the second quotation which I uh, presented to members of the Council was the one referring to the conclusion which uh, uh, the people in Ukraine came up to, that uh, uh, it was one source of uh, sniper fire uh, which killed uh, a large number of people during the final stage of uh, the dramatic developments in, uh, in Kiev. And uh, of course it's not, and, and also to the fact that the new authorities somehow are avoiding investigating this, uh, uh, the, this, this shooting and what happened in, the, uh, in, in Kyiv in the last days uh, of the crisis, uh, which uh, led to, um, to the uh, February 21 agreement and further dramatic developments. I suggest that that maybe it's one reason why they are trying to walk away from the February 21 agreement, that it does provide for, uh, for investigation. As to who was the source of sniper fire, you may have seen the footage on the internet, we, I've seen it on television, that there were clearly uh, opposition snipers who took over a hotel in downtown in downtown um, Kiev who were, uh, who were working as snipers shooting at somebody um, in the streets. So now it's obvious that they were the ones who were killing uh, both uh, the policemen and those who were protesting uh, in order to uh, exploit even further protest and take power by force to execute this coup uh, in, uh, in Ukraine. And finally, uh, going to the core of our discussion as to what can be done next, I simply referred colleagues to a statement which was made today by Foreign Minister Lavrov in Rome after he com completed another round of discussions with Secretary Kerry and maybe other officials uh, when he said, uh, speaking about uh, uh, various possibilities of international role in uh, dealing with the crisis in Ukraine, that we need to, uh, to understand better what our partners mean, those who su suggest uh, that they, we create various mechanisms, what would be the composition of those mechanisms. But he also emphasized, and I encourage you to go to the uh, original that it's very important for us what we'll be dealing with, that we need to talk about implementing uh, February 21 agreement, uh, uh, constitutional reform, presidential elections after the presidential reform, forming the national coalition government, and also it's crucially important to involve uh, uh, the uh, regions and have uh, expressed agreement from various regions uh, in uh, uh, all the processes which uh, may be taking place uh, in Ukraine in order to uh, resolve that crisis. So these are my, Matthew. Sure. Wonder, th this issue of the, of the same snipers uh, shooting at both, is, do you think this is within the type of thing that Mr. Simonovich should be investigating? And also the U.S. sanctions today. I know that you sometimes say you only speak about the, about the U.N. The U.S. announced that it has a travel ban list and new set of sanctions. That can, do you think it's useful uh, for the process taking uh, well, place in there? Well, first of all, I hope uh, uh, Mr. Simonovich and, in fact, uh, uh, Mr. Eliasson, too, can uh, at least encourage this investigation, and that would be uh, they are playing their part in uh, implementing at least one part of, uh, uh, of uh, February the 21 uh, agreement. As to the sanctions, I don't want to go into it. It's a double-edged sword, and of course uh, we cannot possibly regard it as something which, uh, which is useful under any circumstances. Uh, go ahead. Um, Ambassador, thank you. Why Russia is opposing to negotiations with the government uh, in, in Ukraine, and uh, in, you are insisting on using force uh, instead. No, we are not. We are not insisting on uh, any use of force. Uh, uh, what uh, we are saying is that we do not recognize uh, the current uh, Ukrainian authorities as legitimate. 
We do have various working contacts. We do have non-political con uh, contacts with them. As you probably know, Prime Minister Medvedev even spoke to uh, Prime Minister Yitzhenyuk uh, uh, who, I mean, several days ago discussing various uh, aspects of the situation and uh, our government uh, is under instructions from President Putin uh, to continue uh, dealing with various specific economic uh, problems uh, and, and uh, maybe cooperation which we uh, have uh, with uh, Ukraine. However, political contacts were uh, refraining from, especially at a high level of foreign minister and level like this, simply because we don't, uh, we don't uh, accept the legitimacy of uh, those authorities. But also, uh, the other important uh, element of our uh, understanding of how we need to deal with the current crisis and how we could find uh, a way out is uh, uh, this reference to February 21, what we are going to discuss, what various groups which can be formed, contact, some mentioning a contest group, some other formations, what, the, what are they actually going to, to do? We need to have a clear program of, uh, of work. One uh, question. Uh, I'd like to ask your, posi permission, uh, your position on the referendum that has been called in Crimea on March the 16th. That's only 10 days away. Mm -hmm. There are armed groups on the ground intimidating people, including Mr. Seri. Could you possibly have a free and fra fair referendum in well, just 10 this days? Well, this is a decision which was taken by the Supreme Soviet of the Autonomous Republic of Crimea. They intend to hold a referendum. Uh, as you probably know, I learned it from the media that there are two questions which they are going to put to the uh, will of the people. One uh, joining Russia, another is staying uh, in Ukraine within, with, with sort of broader, broader powers as an autonomous uh, republic. So this is where things are. Other than that, I, I don't know. I, 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 no, I mean, I am, a, uh, I am a Russian observer. They made this decision, and of course, uh, our authorities will need to, uh, you know, to make a decision how they are going to, to deal with that. Thank you. The Ukrainian ambassador uh, suggested that um, it was Russians who were involved in this uh, uh, situation with Mr. Seri. And then one other thing, a number of ambassadors that I've spoken to here uh, privately said that they, they don't understand how Russia could suggest that these um, uh, militias or military personnel in Crimea are not Russian, the ones that, are, well, that don't I, have any markings. I, I, described, I described a very complex uh, uh, setup which uh, we have in, uh, uh, in the Crimea now in terms of military presence in the uh, Security Council meeting on the 4th. I mean, you have to understand that there is uh, the Black Sea Fleet and some military with the Black Sea Fleet. Then there, is, uh, uh, the, there are people uh, who are with the uh, uh, Ukrainian military presence there, and some of them ha have uh, sworn allegiance to uh, the uh, authorities of the Autonomous uh, Republic of Crimea. And then there are also various uh, self-defense groups uh, which sprang up, I think, uh, even before or, or like uh, immediately after February 21 because uh, of the, uh, what they perceived as the aggravation of the situation. As to uh, what exactly and who uh, malhandled uh, Mr. Seri, and I did say I was very relieved to see him back in, in Kiev, safe, safe and sound. Uh, I, I don't know exactly, but uh, I think you should look up uh, the last paragraph of uh, Mr. Eliasson's conversation with, uh, with, with you, I think, or some of you, on the 5th of, uh, uh, of I mean, uh, as, as the events were unfolding, when he described a ragtag group of people uh, who were accosting Mr. Seri. Frankly, to me, it does not sound like it was a group of Russian soldiers on the basis of uh, this description. Thank you very much.